I'm Steve McDowell, Chief Analyst and Founder at NAND Research, and I am at HashiCorp with Chris Van Wessel, Senior Director of Product Marketing, right? That's right. Uh, thanks for having me in, Chris. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, who HashiCorp is and what are the problems that you're trying to solve? Uh, so I think in the biggest sense of things, the, the yeah. problem that's kind of on the table is companies over the last decade have been moving to the cloud but not always getting all the results that they thought they were going to get. There was an interesting piece recently by PwC that said that while 78% of organizations have either mostly or completely adopted cloud throughout the organization, only 10% of them consider themselves to be a cloud-powered organization. And so then you got to ask yourself, what's the disparity? Why, why mm -hmm. the disconnect? And I think it gets down to some fundamental things that, you know, at the core of it, developers are one of the most constrained resources uh, in terms of moving a business forward. They're the ones that are most tightly connected to the applications and services that matter to, to the organization. And so the more productive you can make them, the better for the organization. And as you transition to cloud, a lot of times what people want to do is just bring the traditional data center workflows, organizational structures, tool chains mm -hmm. to that new environment. But due to a lot of the differences in cloud, that doesn't always work out the way that they'd expect. Well, let's it. talk about this. I remember the early days of cloud and you know, it was, it was going to solve all of our problems. Right? The finance guys were never going to have to spend capital. Everything's going to become cloud native. Developers are going to be unblocked. But are they? I mean, you spend a lot of time talking. I mean, your customers are, are IT people across the spectrum and developers across the spectrum. Uh, are developers blocked and, uh, and why? Uh, I think the short answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, we've been doing this for over a decade and worked with thousands of customers. And what we tend to find is there's uh, blocks in terms of productivity. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is uh, a lot of times developers will be waiting for the infrastructure that they need or the security to be set up properly in the environments that they want to be working in. And depending on the setup, like if they're using, if they're not using something like Terraform, you, you might be looking at uh, days or weeks, you know, once you put a request in to actually get that provisioned. If you are using something like Terraform, but you aren't using it as a common shared service across the entire organization, you still end up in a world where teams aren't collaborating as effectively as they could be, and central organizations have a, a, a harder time applying policy and governance uh, like they would like to. And so all of that tends to slow down uh, developers' productivity. And Terraform is your solution to do what? It's infrastructure, provisioning, management? Yeah. How would you describe? Great call out. So, yeah. uh, Terraform is our product that is is focused on infrastructure as code. So think about the provisioning and management of the infrastructure that powers your applications. Okay. So the movement to cloud did not solve all of our problems. Did it bring new problems? I mean, did it... I think it it brought a lot of great opportunities. Right. You got yeah. all this, all these resources at your fingertips, all the scalability that's possible with them, but the ephemeral nature of those resources. Uh, and, and like I said, the, the new uh, workflows that are required to, to make these things most effective, that's where the challenges end up uh, coming in. And where do platform teams fit? This is a, the idea of a platform team has kind of arisen over the past decade, right? As we've uh, you know, embraced kind of cloud and hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. Um, how do you look at platform teams and, and the role that they play? We think platform teams are pretty central. Um, some people talk about platform engineering, some people talk about the cloud center of excellence. Uh, mm -hmm. At a fundamental level, it's a centralized team who's chartered with uh, presenting to the organization a common way of consuming cloud resources. Yeah. And so uh, what we tend to find is that as organizations start their transition into cloud, they will typically allow every uh, development team to kind of do what they, they will, you know, whatever helps them to move most quickly uh, they have the free reign to do that. But what you end up finding in relatively short order is that amount of freedom also comes with a cost in terms of uh, the amount of spend that's taking place, mm -hmm. the amount of risk that's being introduced right. into the organization. And so companies tend to quickly realize that if they can implement a standardized uh, and programmatic approach to cloud consumption, they can enable the speed that the developers are looking for while also ensuring the cost controls and governance and security policies as well. Sure, sure. So this is a journey, right? I mean, IT organizations and development organizations evolve over time, right? And and I know that, that HashiCorp talks about 
kind of the cycle of innovation as we move forward, or maturity rather. Um, how do you look at that, and where do you see kind of the industry on this kind of path toward maturity uh, to solve the kind of problem we're talking about? I think it's still pretty early days. Yeah. Um, like I said, we've been at this for over a decade, and, and what we found is, you know, we ended up building a lot of great technologies mm -hmm. that worked amazingly well for the, uh, the innovators, the early adopters, if you kind of right. think about the typical maturity uh, curve. What we're transitioning into now is that early majority, and this is actually a bigger portion of the market, um, but the thing that, that we believe differentiates this group from the previous groups is that this group, they are uh, big fans of the possibilities of, of what doing cloud right can mean for them, but they they don't necessarily understand how to get there. They probably feel like they don't have the right people in place to make it a, a reality. And so what they tend to be looking for is a more prescriptive approach. Uh, so working with a vendor that can really guide them in that process. Uh, and then the way that the products are set up, the, the less that they need to manage themselves and can consume as a SaaS offering, the better. And so that's why we've been making a lot of the changes that we've been making. Well, let's talk about those changes. So you, you, you've begun talking about something called the infrastructure cloud. What is that? Yeah, great question. Yeah. Uh, so the infrastructure cloud is our newly announced way of, of thinking about lifecycle management for infrastructure and security of your most important applications. And so by virtue of this, it also helps establish a system of record for that infrastructure and security uh, of those applications. And how is that approach different from other cloud management tools? I mean, the industry is full of tools that promise to solve these problems. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a couple of things to think mm -hmm. about. Uh, the first is uh, kind of the, uh, I'll say the ubiquitous nature of, of what we do. So the way our products are set up, and for those of your listeners who may not be familiar with HashiCorp, mm -hmm. the fundamental concept is translating all of the needs for infrastructure and security into code. Yeah. And by, by making a code, that means it can be declarative, it can be reusable, it can provide that system of record that everybody's looking for when they want to go and, and do more efficient audits, et cetera. Um, but what that allows you to do is it's also agnostic to the backend provider. So if you're working in GCP, if you're working in AWS uh, or, or Azure, it actually doesn't matter. What you're trying to provision is a virtual machine. And mm -hmm. so the command for doing that is the same. Our product ends up being the translation layer for you to work with any of those providers. And similarly, that extends broadly out into the broader ecosystem. Uh, we've got something on the order of 3,500 integrations with Terraform, hundreds of integrations with Vault. Um, the provider for AWS for Terraform just surpassed its two and a half billionth download. Um, so what I think people find is we're kind of the industry standard when it comes to yeah. this approach and the the agnostic nature of, of how we do it just lets them work really well in their multi-cloud environments. So we talked about Terraform earlier and you just mentioned Vault. So Vault is your secrets management solution? How would you describe Vault? Yeah, Vault is fundamentally the anchor for our security lifecycle management part of the infrastructure cloud, and okay. secrets management is the, the core thing. That, and that's that a fundamental does. part of the infrastructure cloud, right? Because yep. we talk about infrastructure management, which is... Um, yeah, so if you think about infrastructure cloud, the, the two pieces are infrastructure lifecycle management and security lifecycle management. Those are each anchored by one of our two core products, okay. uh, the first being Terraform on the infrastructure side and Vault on Got the security it. side. And it's important to note that all of these are then presented on top of the HashiCorp Cloud Platform, which is the SaaS platform okay. uh, to make those available. So infrastructure cloud, understand the concept. How does that translate to reality? What are people able to do? Over, like I said, over the decades and thousands of customers, uh, yeah. what we've, we've realized is there's a fairly standard pattern of adoption for cloud maturity. And mm -hmm. we've built out what uh, we call the, the cloud maturity model. And it's really a blueprint for companies in terms of how they can adopt cloud more efficiently. Uh, when you think about the infrastructure side of things, it fundamentally starts at, you know, are you able to, you know, create infrastructure as code and, and actually go through that process? But then it quickly expands into how does the collaboration work between your teams? So what's the VCS integration right. look like, the CICD integration? Right. That would then expand to how do you share code between the teams? Do you have a private registry uh, that people can have access to for modules that they might want to leverage? 
then you can move into things like policy management and enforcement. And ultimately, you kind of get to this place where you've got observability, remediation, uh, and even self-service capabilities. So it's a that's a full spectrum. And we go quite deep on all this stuff. We've built mm -hmm. out what we call HashiCorp validated designs. So when people work with us on deployments, right. there's a prescriptive guidance for how they go about uh, getting those deployed. On the security side, it really, like you said, it's, it's about secrets management fundamentally. There's an aspect of getting your arms wrapped around all the secrets that exist, not just the ones that you're aware of, but the ones that you might not be aware of, bringing those under management, being able to rotate those on an automated way uh, and regular basis, transitioning the appropriate ones to dynamic secrets, uh, being able to leverage those for just-in-time uh, access, for example, like privileged access management, and then ultimately moving to a place where you've got encryption as a service, uh, and then again, the observability and remediation uh, that comes in some of the more sophisticated implementations. So you've talked a lot about um, the technological benefits, right? The benefits to the IT guy. Uh, at the end of the day, though, there has to be business value, yeah. right? How do you look at what you're doing with the infrastructure cloud? Now you're thinking about the infrastructure cloud. How does that translate to business value? Uh, well, I'd say in a few ways. Yeah. Um, and and the, the first one kind of being um, speed and efficiency. Mm -hmm. the, the bottom line is, is that uh, in a lot of the current uh, environments that developers work in, they, are, they, they need to wait for right. you know, the provision environment to show up. Uh, once they put a request in, it might take a week or two weeks for that environment to show up. So right out of the gate, there's efficiencies to be gained if you can just automate that process. Similarly with secrets rotation, we know that most people rotate their secrets maybe once a year, if that, that is certainly not best industry best practices. But part of the reason they don't do it is because it takes a lot of time to go yeah. through and make that process happen. So again, the ability to automate those things uh, frees up a lot of capacity. And when you play that out into the future and start thinking about, well, what we really want to do is be able to and we showcased this a little bit with uh, our product HCP Waypoint last uh, fall at our conference. What we want to be able to do is provide to our developers predefined application profiles uh, that they can click and have it automatically execute and say, go grab the resources, go grab the workloads, set up the security, uh, connect the networks, et cetera, all in one big workflow, and then do whatever add-ons might be needed afterwards. So at, that's the notion of an IDP, an internal developer platform, okay. um, which a lot of people are excited about these days, although I think the, the versions that are out there in the market, they tend to find a little bit cumbersome and challenging to use. So I think our take is going to be something a little bit different where it's dedicated for HashiCorp shops yeah. uh, and, and work really well for them in that way. So if I'm a CIO, right, I care about a couple of things. Uh, I need to serve the needs of the of the enterprise by by deploying applications as quickly as possible, to get that business value right that the applications are in. But I also care about cost and I care about risk. Uh, does infrastructure cloud address that? How? how? Yeah, uh, certainly the speed factor is one, but you mentioned the other two. It's it's cost and risk. Um, if I think about cost. There are the soft costs of, you know, people are one of my most constrained resource. We see that time and time again. And so to the extent that you can free up capacity in your workforce by not having them do things that could be automated, there's, there's value there right out of the gate. Um, but there's other things that we do uh, that, that address the cost side of things. For example, um, Sentinel, which is our policy as code mm -hmm. uh, capabilities, that allows you to enforce prior to any deployment uh, whatever policies you might have and and those policies could be cost related so based on your role you may not have the right to deploy an extra large virtual machine uh, for whatever you're doing uh, so so you can put controls in place regarding what people have the ability to deploy right out of the gate and then you could also set up things like we have a, a capability called ephemeral workspaces which basically says when a workspace is created at that time, you should also establish a point in time at which it will be decommissioned. So many of the uh, the resources that people complain about overspending in cloud end up being dev test environments that were spun up and never taken back down again. And so this is a nice way of reclaiming those resources automatically. So that's, that's on the cost side of the equation. There's a number of things like that. On the risk side of the equation, again, uh, I would go back to uh, the simple notion of, you know, 
do you know where all your secrets are? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have capabilities with HCP radar to discover all those secrets. Are they actively being managed? Are they being rotated on a regular basis? Are they dynamic when they need to be dynamic? And then are you leveraging the Sentinel policy as well to help inform the governance and risk mitigations that you want to have in your organization? When we talk about risk mitigation, right, we have to talk about trust. And the things you're talking about kind of make HashiCorp uh, central right, to, to IT operations. Um, if I'm an enterprise, why should I trust HashiCorp? And, and to your point, it, it really is becoming a, I'll call it a P0 set of applications for people. Um, and what, we, what we've what we realized, and I think a lot of customers have realized over the last decade, is uh, the fundamental nature of HashiCorp tech to them. Like, for example, uh, when you go to Starbucks and get a coffee, that transaction runs through HashiCorp. Uh, when you order something that's delivered by UPS, that is facilitated through HashiCorp. Really? If you trade on the London Stock Exchange, that transaction is backed by HashiCorp. So uh, this, these are examples of very large organizations that we've built that level of trust with. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of the best way that we can showcase this is, is by kind of showing the, the large organizations that have really trusted their, their business to HashiCorp. So how real is this? Are customers deploying it, using it today? And, and if they are, what, what do they think? What's the feedback that you're hearing? You know, the excitement's been pretty palpable. Mm -hmm. uh, the company right now is on the order of about, we just started this transition a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Uh, we're about 15% of our revenues now come from our cloud offerings, and we expect that to grow pretty significantly over the next period of time. Um, what's fun for me, though, is that the people that you're starting to see adopted now are not the typical, you know, what you would call the uh, frontline, you know, most highly technically, you know, innovative companies. It's more of kind of a lot of your bread and butter companies. Like a great example is uh, the California Department of Healthcare Services, which is the largest uh, state local government entity in, in the country. Mm -hmm. They have recently adopted uh, Terraform Cloud, uh, which is now HCP Terraform. Um, and the, the reason that they did so is because they had a lot of legacy infrastructure, they had a lot of disconnected applications that they were trying to move forward into the cloud, and the system that they've set up is now in a position to, to, uh, to take care of up to 200 applications that they have. They've got a more highly performance system that has reduced uh, the time to get new applications provisioned by 70%. Uh, and they're doing it fewer, with fewer people. So it's kind of a win-win for them, and so they're super excited about the system. And I, I love to hear stories like that, because what that tells me, right, because you know, organizations like that, they're not bleeding edge adopters, typically, right. right? They're just trying to solve real business problems. And that tells me that the approach you're taking is solving a real business problem for them. Yeah, right? that's the I idea. Mean, that, that's, there's no better validation of that. Um, so you have it deployed, you talked about, you know, there's a lot of investment that's continuing on. Uh, you're getting feedback from customers. How are you looking uh, toward the future? Where's this all going? You know, um, I think we've actually, we've laid out a pretty good uh, program of adoption over mm -hmm. time. And, and, and a lot of people, like I said, are still in kind of those earlier phases. So we'll certainly continue to look to help bring them along and, and get them to more advanced scenarios. Uh, you'll see Waypoint come out later this year, which is that self-service, you know, provisioning environment. Uh, kind of that IDP offering. And ultimately, you kind of want to get to the point where um, the developer who is actively trying to create new innovation can really stop worrying about the underlying infrastructure and security protocols, and those just kind of happen seamlessly behind the scenes for them. And once you kind of get there, that'll be a more, a more perfect world that, that we'd be pretty excited about. All right. So we use the word cloud a lot, right? Do I have to be running on the cloud to get the benefit of the things that you've talked about? Of the yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, there is so much push to cloud, right? And mm -hmm. that's where everybody wants to go. But there are also real, real reasons as to why people haven't made that transition. And those are completely valid as well. And so the nice thing about HashiCorp Technologies is it really is pretty agnostic about what you're running. As long as something has an API and can be touched in that way, then our products can work with it. So we have a lot of folks that use it for their VMware environments on premises. We have okay. a lot of people using it to manage their Cisco gear. Um, it, it works in a lot of scenarios. Everybody uses Terraform. <laughs> Seems to be the way. 
Thanks again, Chris. And viewers, if you want more information about the infrastructure cloud or anything that we've talked about, it's HashiCorp.com. Uh, and I think there's a special website, HashiCorp.com slash infrastructure cloud. You don't have to remember that. We'll put it in the notes. Uh, it's a great conversation. Yeah, thank thanks. you. And we'll do it again soon.